Hi, welcome to another 10 minute series from Kelly Handerhan and Cybertrain IT. And this particular series is on why you will pass the CISSP exam. I uh, know that other folks in the industry, I know there's a popular uh, set of videos out there on why you won't pass. I tend to be an optimist and I have faith that you are gonna pass this exam but what you have to know is you have to know the CISSP mindset. I have no doubt that any of you that are out there planning on taking this exam are doing your best work and studying for it, right? You've heard it's a hard exam before. It covers a lot of different topics across a lot of uh, the IT spectrum. There's a lot of stuff to memorize, so I know you're studying. But the thing is, is it takes more than understanding the material to pass this particular exam. And that's just how it is, okay? There's a very specific mindset that unfortunately a lot of people don't know walking into the exam. And that's my job. I'm gonna help you get there, okay? So here are 10 rules that I think, or 10 um, uh, things, considerations maybe, that I'd like you to keep in mind when you walk in and you take your exam. So first of all, the most important thing I can tell you, remember that your role is that of a risk advisor on this exam. Do not fix problems. Don't do it. You're gonna be tempted. Most of us have our jobs because we're problem solvers. We know what to do. We know what to fix. That is not your role on this exam. Your role on this exam is to collect information report that information to senior management, give them your advice based on risk management, and we'll talk about that in a second. The choices and decisions come from senior management down. You can think of the idea that escalations go up, decisions come, come down. So an example of this, for instance, if on the exam, you see that uh, one of our employees is getting terminated and we expect it to be a contentious termination, what's the first thing you should do? And I'll guarantee you 90% of folks out there are going to say, oh, revoke their credentials. But that's fixing a problem. If I'm truly your company's risk advisor, when do I go down to the basement and log onto a server and disable an account? I don't, right? What do I do? I call and advise the appropriate parties. I have influenced policy within your organization to have a set of processes and procedures. But I, or read into this, you on this exam are not a doer. You're not a worker bee. You are a manager and you should act accordingly. This is not the type of exams exam where you're blocking ports on firewalls, you're blocking user access, you're disabling accounts. You do none of that. An advisor or a chief uh, risk officer, um, a CISO, or an ISO, kind of think about those uh, as your role on the exam when you're taking the exam, you don't do the hands-on anymore. But you have to understand enough information about the hands-on to make good uh, suggestions to senior management, okay? Don't fix problems. Everybody's tempted to. That's where my folks that study really hard and are really solid technical people mess up. They know how to fix the problem, so they fix it but that's not your role. One other quick thought here is when you just rush in and fix a problem, <clears throat> excuse me, you're violating change control, right? There should be a specific set of steps on how you approach changes in your organization. If everybody's just jumping to their feet, running around fixing problems, we don't have the control over those changes. We don't have documentation. We don't have rollback strategies. You know, um, we don't have proper testing. What if I were to just patch systems in my organization every time Microsoft released a new patch? That might not be the best thing for my career. You know, hopefully you can agree on that. So the idea is running around fixing problems violates change control. What we want to do is pay attention to the process and then the problems will fix themselves. Okay, so that's the first, that's the most important thing I can tell you. Second thing, who is responsible for security? 
we've all heard everyone's responsible, not true. When you hear that idea of responsibility, I want you to think culpable negligence. Okay, who is held legally responsible for the security of an organization? Senior management. But don't we all have responsibilities? Sure. My responsibility is to follow policies and procedures as laid out by senior management. Okay, so make sure, again, going back to the idea that our job is to advise senior management, but they make the decisions. Why? Because they're ultimately responsible. Now, on three, um, <clears throat> this is another question I tend to ask my classes, and a lot of folks get this wrong. The question is, how much security is enough? And sometimes we hear, oh, you can never have enough security. Sure you can. You have too much security when you're spending more to protect an asset than that asset's worth, right? I'm not going to spend $50 to protect a $20 bill. So even though you may hear, oh, you could never have enough security, you need, and, and I say this in my classes and people always look at me, you know, a little like I'm a little shady when I say, you know how much security is enough? Just enough. Just enough security is enough. Now, many people think I'm saying, oh, cut every corner you can and, you know, see, do as little as you can get away with. And that's absolutely not what I'm saying is you need to know exactly how much just enough is. So how do I know that? Risk management. Figure out what my assets are. What am I protecting? What are they worth? I'm never going to spend more money than an asset's worth to protect it, right? But I also have to think about what are the threats and the vulnerabilities and what's my potential for loss. So I'm not going to spend more money than my potential for loss to protect an asset. It doesn't make sense. Where companies get into trouble is they underestimate the value of their assets. Because if I look at a computer and I say, oh, that thing's worth 200 bucks, that might be true of the hardware, but where does the value of that computer really come from? It comes from the data that's on it. So if we don't properly understand how valuable what we're protecting is, and you know, companies underestimate things like reputation, right? Uh, brand recognition, customer sentiment or loyalty or all those things, they're really hard to quantif quantify. But that all makes up the value of our asset and that's what I'm protecting. So when we take that into consideration properly, then we have a true understanding of the value of what we're protecting. And we will spend, you know, up to the amount of potential for loss. But if we misunderestimate, that's a George Bushism, by the way, and that's not picking on Bush. That's a great word. That should absolutely be a word in the dictionary. Misunderestimate. If we underestimate the value of our assets, we'll make bad decisions. Okay, so how, how much security is enough? Risk management will tell you. Start risk management by identifying and figuring out the value of your assets. <clears throat> five, question five or point five. Think end game. Think end game. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you're going to see a lot of questions that say, which is the best, or which is the most, or which is this, that, and the other. And they all sound pretty good. But one is our ultimate purpose. End game means at what point can I go, I'm through. So for instance, if I ask you why we classify data, and I give you a choice of A, and maybe A is to indicate data sensitivity, B can be to indicate the harm if data is compromised. Um, C, to indicate um, the requirements for availability of data. And D, to dictate how data is protected. Okay, it's not that A, B, and C are wrong, right? Classification of data does indicate its sensitivity, harm if it's compromised, availability stuff can be used as well. But that's not why. Because if all I do is say, wow, look at this laptop, it has some really sensitive stuff on it, and then walk away, that hasn't helped me at all. That's not end game. End game 
The reason I want to say this stat is top secret is because by labeling it as top secret, we have a set of minimum security standards and settings or configurations that are applied to that asset. So end game isn't, you know, all these things are true or they aren't, they probably are. But what is the point where I can say, I've done what I said I was going to do. Okay, for instance, um, <clears throat> why do we train people? Is it to raise, raise security awareness? Is it to educate our users on common security vulnerabilities? Is it to give users a greater understanding? All that sounds great. Those are not the reasons we train people. You know why we train people? Because we want to modify their behavior. Now, but what about security awareness? Honestly, I'm not so concerned about what users are aware of as what they do. Because as senior management, I'm held accountable for what my users do, not what they know. So raising security awareness sounds good, but what I'm really after is to have my users do different things. That's end game. And that's how you have to think about it. Okay. Uh, security transcends technologies. Don't configure firewalls on this exam. Don't look for purely technical solutions. Don't look for um, uh, solutions that are too heavy on technology. You know, um, I took this exam years ago, years and years and years ago uh, for the first time. And then I took it again several years back because uh, I'd let my credential lapse. But ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, I could have studied the exact same notes and still done as well on the second test as I did on the test years earlier. You know why? Firewalls come and go. Brands come and go. New technologies. We go from different algorithms or different, uh, we go from WEP to WPA2, whatever. But the security mindset doesn't change. The focus on security, secure concepts, like, as you can see, uh, number nine, incorporate security into the design of what you're building. Layer your defenses, number 10. Um, isolation, that's a foundation of, of security. Separate your trusted resources from untrusted entities. Keep unidentified users out of your databases, right? That separation is a principal threat. So when it comes right down to it, the technology changes, it comes and goes, but the principles of security have stayed the same and they always will, okay? So security transcends technology. Look for the idea that is, or your answers that are based in good security foundational ideas and start those decisions with risk management. So um, I'm going to skip to eight. Hey, technical people, get out of the weeds. I know so many smart technical people that have a hard time with this exam because they have a hard time backing it up. If you're trying to find the answer that says hack the registry, that is the wrong answer, right? This is an exam of gathering information, looking at risk management, and making a good decision on what should happen, being able to advise senior management well. As a manager, you're a step removed from the day-to-day -day trenches. And I know that that may not be your real job. I know that you really may be a technical person, an engineer, whatever that may be. Not on this exam. Think like a manager. Fix the process. Think about the good of the business. Understand that the only reason any of us have jobs is because something that we do supports the business. So when it comes to decision making, when it comes to the needs, the business leads. That's what you need to know for this exam. You don't need to know what Windows Event Error 1582 is. You need to know why you review the security logs and what information you can get from them. All right. And then one last parting thought, maybe this is a little out of order, but number seven, I wanted to mention uh, physical safety is always the correct use. What's the most important thing we do in security? We protect our assets. Our most valuable assets will 
always be our people. That'll come up when you start talking about disaster recovery, business continuity planning, and really any answer, you're always going to put your priorities on human life. All right, so just to sum up, these are 10 principles that I think you really need to know walking into the CISSP exam. Now, that's after you do your studying, you go through, you learn your material, you're solid on your material, and you understand that. But if you don't walk in with the right mindset, you're not going to do as well as you want to do. And honestly, as well as you want to do is 700 or above. Your goal is is to not know what your score is because they only tell you your score if you if you miss passing. I have faith that you've studied, but what I know that a lot of people miss are these 10 aspects of the mindset you have to have walking into this exam particularly. This is a very specific train of thought or school of thought to pass the CISSB exam, and I think if you follow these rules, they will help you tremendously. So I want to thank you for taking the time for watching. Uh, I'm Kelly Handerhan again, and Cybertrain.it is my organization that I work with. Um, you can reach me at Kelly H at Cybertrain.it. I would love it if you'd come like our face, our Facebook page. I'm going to be releasing these 10-minute series uh, roughly <clears throat> several times a week, and hopefully I can help you as you strive to um, tackle some of these certifications. If you'd like to have me come out and teach a class to your company, uh, or if you're curious about other training opportunities that I can help you fulfill, uh, like I said, I'd love to hear from you. So best of luck on your certifications. Go out and get the CISSP. Make sure you know the mindset first.